Alright, so this video is going to focus on acid-base solution stoichiometry, also known as neutralization um, solution stoichiometry. Um, hopefully this um, picture looks a little familiar to you from our lab this week. Um, how you are titrating a base with an, um, or an acid with a base. And then as you get closer and closer to the point where you have equal moles of acid and base, um, so that the reaction, reactants are both used completely, um, you will see that pink color. We'd like it to be a little lighter. Um, that's indicating that the reaction is completed. Um, so terms I want you to kind of be familiar with. Um, volumetric analysis is kind of a larger um, way to describe um, performing a titration, what you're doing in order to allow that titration to take place. Um, titration, again, is what you did in lab this week, and I think it's what you're going to be doing next week, where you take um, a solution from um, out of a burette and you add it to the solution that you are wanting to analyze. So the titrant is what's in the burette and the analyte is what is in your Erlenmeyer flask. Um, typically your analyte is going to be something um, that is easier to start with as a solid. So that's what we did this week with our KHP. Um, and then your titrant is something that can clean out of the burettes pretty easily. Um, and is going to be able to be added in sufficient quantities to see the reaction completed. So that would be your strong acid or base. Um, what we were measuring when the color turned pink was basically where the equivalence point was. Um, we want to try to um, add just enough base to neutralize the acid, the analyte, or whatever is in your Erlenmeyer flask with what's in your burette, your titrant. Um, and that's also known as the stoichiometric point. Um, we do that by picking an indicator that will change colors closest, as close as possible to that equivalence point. And when the indicator changes colors, that's um, typically called its end point. Um, the indicator is actually a weak acid or it could be a weak base. And depending on the pH of the mixture, um, that allows the weak acid or weak base to either be deprotonated or protonated. And we see the color change occur. Um, phenophthalein is often used in weak acid strong base titrations. Um, it tends to change color around a pH of 8, and that's typically pretty close to what you would expect to see for a weak acid strong base titration. Um, so again, um, you are going to put your analyte in the Erlenmeyer flask, your titrant in the burette. Um, and we were trying to determine um, a, the known concentration of that NaOH, um, which is why we had a set amount of the KHP in our Erlenmeyer flask. The amount of water we added did not really influence um, how quickly um, the solution turned colors because it was the net amount of KHP in there that was going to determine how much acid was available to react with the base. Um, as you start to add it, you start to see that pinkish color show up but it disappears as soon as the base has been neutralized by the acid in the Erlenmeyer flask. And as you get closer and closer to neutralizing all of the acid, we see that the solution keeps more of a steady pink color, and that's an indicator that the reaction is complete. So we're going to do three reactions, or three examples involving acid-base reactions, and that'll be it for today. Um, the first one is determining how much of a 0.1 molar solution of HCl would be needed to neutralize 38.3 mils of 0.25 molar NaOH. Um, so it's a classic acid-base reaction between the hydrochloric acid, strong acid, and the strong base NaOH. And from what we saw in our previous um, part one of this unit, when you add an acid to a base, you make water and a salt, especially if um, your base is a strong base. And so um, everything is in a one-to-one -one ratio. Um, we have one chlorine, one sodium, one oxygen and two hydrogens on both sides. Um, so this pretty much matches up with the lab we did this week in terms of a one-to-one -one ratio between the acid HCl and the NaOH according to their coefficients. We know the volume and the concentration of our NaOH and because we want to find out the volume of our reactant acid, um, both reactants are going to be used completely. So we need to find first the moles of the NaOH because that's going to limit how much of the HCl is needed. Um, to get the moles, we need to multiply the molarity times the volume in liters. So I converted the 38.3 into 0 .0383 liters, and I multiplied it by the molarity. 
both had three sig figs, so once the leaders are canceled out and I multiply, I got that there was actually 0 .00958 moles of NaOH present. That's also how many moles of HCl are present by using the coefficients from your balanced equation. So now we know how much HCl we have, and if we know the moles of the HCl that would have been needed to neutralize the base, and we know its concentration, we can use our molarity triangle and solve for liters, which would be moles divided by molarity. Um, the moles cancel out. Both the molarity and the moles have three sig figs, so that gives me 0 .0958 liters of the 0.1 molar HCl solution was needed, or you could say 95.8 milliliters. Now you do not have to do those all in separate steps if you want to just keep going and go from the moles of NaOH to moles of HCl and then use that to get your volume. You are welcome to do so. I just wanted to kind of show it to you in a step-by-step -step process so you could see how the parts fit together. Um, the reason we're doing the second example, it's pretty much like the first one, is that the stoichiometric ratio this time is not going to be one-to-one -one because we're working with an alkaline earth base barium hydroxide. And we want to know how much of that barium hydroxide solution we would need to add to use up 25 mils of 0.2 molar HCl. So this time it's a 2 to 1 ratio between the acid and the base. We have a set amount of acid, the 25 mils of 0.2 molar HCl being added, so that is acting theoretically as our limiting reactant, but both are going to be used completely. But in order to figure out how much of the barium hydroxide is used, we need to figure out how many moles of HCl are going to be used by taking the volume in liters and multiplying it by the molarity and that gives me my moles of HCl. The relationship between HCl and barium hydroxide is 2 to 1 so we actually are going to need half that number of moles to use up all of our base um, because again of the coefficients in our balanced equation. So 0 0.00250 moles of barium hydroxide will be required that along with its molarity will help me find my volume. So I take those moles, I divide it by the 0 0.05 molar concentration, and when I do that, both have three sig figs, I get that I would need 0 0.0500 liters, or I would need 50.0 milliliters of the barium hydroxide solution. Um, so I need roughly double the amount of barium hydroxide, in part because the concentration is so much more dilute than the HCl. If they had been equal concentrations, I would have needed roughly half of the barium hydroxide solution because of that 2 to 1 ratio. And so our final question is going to be figuring out about one of the products. This time I give you information about both reactants and I want to know how much water would be made when the reaction is complete. So I have HNO3 and calcium hydroxide. Again, that's going to make a 2 to 1 ratio. Water would be formed along with the calcium and nitrate compound, CaNO32. I know the volume and molarity I have for both reactants, so I can use those to find the moles of the HNO3 and the CaOH2 that are available to react by multiplying the molarities by their volumes in liters. So when I did that for HNO3, I got 0 0.0116 moles. And when I did that for calcium hydroxide, I got 0 0.00426 moles. I need to figure out which one of those is limiting, and I need to figure out how much water could be made. So I'm going to take the moles of both of those reactants and use those to find the grams of water, the amount of water. If you wanted to do it in moles, you could, but typically we weigh things in, things in grams. So I believe that's how I set this one up. I took the 0 0.0116 moles of HNO3, and I used my balance equation to relate the moles of HNO3 to grams of water. 18.02 for the molar mass, and then multiplied it by the 2 because of the coefficient for water in the balanced equation. And when all was said and done, I got 0 0.209 grams of water. Again, if you had wanted to leave it in moles, you could have done so, but you need to make sure that you're consistent for the other reactant, which is what I'm going to do now with calcium hydroxide. I have that many moles of calcium hydroxide. I want to get from calcium hydroxide, and again, to be consistent, I'm going to go to grams of water so I can have a comparison between these two stoichiometry problems, and that will allow me to determine my limiting reactant. 
and it turns out that the calcium hydroxide makes a smaller amount of water than the HNO3, so my limiting reactant will be the calcium hydroxide, my excess reactant would be the HNO3, and again I already have the moles of both reactants from the first part of the problem where I use the volume similarities to find them. So I'm going to take that information, which one's limiting in excess, along with their relative mole amounts, to find out um, what is the concentration of the H plus or OH minus ions that are left over once the reaction is completed. H plus is coming from your HNO3, OH minus is coming from your CaOH2. We saw that the limiting reactant was the calcium hydroxide, and that that was the number of moles we had of that compound. We also saw that this was our excess reactant and how many moles of the HNO3 that we had present initially. So the one that is in excess would be the one coming from our excess reactant, which would be H+. And in order to find out about H+, we're going to need to figure out um, how many moles we started with of it, how many moles that we used, and then what remains. That total volume that I have to, that I just put up, will also be used to find the concentration, since concentration is a ratio of moles over liters. We started with 0 0.0116 moles of H+. We know that because there's one hydrogen ion in HNO3. And we can figure out how many moles of H+, were used, by taking the amount of calcium hydroxide we started with, and using that to figure out how much H plus would be needed to react with it. Now that might surprise you that I doubled the amount of OH minus from 0 0.00426 to 0 0.00852, but if you look there are two OHs in calcium hydroxide, so for one mole of CaOH2 you would make two moles of hydroxide ions. If we look at water, we see that there is 1H and 1OH to make H2O. So those two are going to react in a one-to-one -one ratio. If I used up all the hydroxide, that's also how much H plus I used. So to get the number of moles of H plus that remain, I take the amount I started with, I subtract away the amount I used, which again is the same as the OH, since there's 1H and 1OH in every water molecule, and that tells me how many moles of H plus remain. To get the concentration, I can now take those moles of H plus, divide it by the volume in liters, and when I do that, I see that it's not present in, sub in substantial quantities, but I have a slight concentration of H plus ions in excess, 0 0.050 molar. And that should be enough to get you through um, the acid-base neutralization problems for that solution-split geometry worksheet.